Maybe closer? Or was it at the very top? top? Yeah, that one. This works for me, this works for you. I think it'll, yep, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, totally, yeah, it's fine. Okay, thank you all for coming out to, uh, to this talk. Uh, today we're gonna talk about the results of an ongoing research project uh, where I've tracked down and analyzed thousands of fishing kits. Uh, we're gonna really quickly kind of recap some of those results and where we are now, and then arguably more importantly, uh, we're going to talk about what this means to, uh, from a defense perspective and what we can take away uh, back to our own organizations. One thing I like about 20-minute talks is that it gives me an excuse to make a very quick introduction. Uh, my name is Jordan. I'm, a, a, I'm working R&D at Duo Security, uh, specifically for the Duo Labs team. I've done security stuff and specifically phishing stuff for quite some time. The other thing that I like about a 20 minute talk is that it allows us to jump right in and that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, fishing kits are around because fishing is a business. Uh, if I put myself in the shoes of an attacker, my goal is to get as many credentials as possible with as little effort as possible. If I can do that, then I've succeeded. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clone a legitimate website only once. I'm gonna change the login form to point to a simple PHP script that I write that collects the credentials and emails them off to me. I'm gonna take all of those files, I'm gonna zip them up, and that's what constitutes a phishing kit. And I can take this phishing kit and I can spread it around to any number of like hacked, hacked WordPress sites, right? Once that zip file is uploaded, I can extract the contents and I have a fresh, ready to go phishing site. Now this research relies on one simple fact, which is attackers are really, really bad about removing that zip file. They're really bad about cleaning up after themselves. So what we can do is, uh, is use a couple of techniques to go and find that zip file, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. But first let's take a look and see what this, uh, th these phishing kits typically look like. This is a structure that you're uh, gonna see most of the time. You're gonna have your zip file, you're gonna have your resources, your images, CSS, JavaScript, uh, and then you're gonna have your PHP script that we talked about. This looks like this. Uh, the, the mailer looks just like what you see in front of you. And it's really self-explanatory. The first part gathers the information, your IP address, credentials, any kind of information the attacker is interested in. And then it creates the email, uh, and, and X phishing dude X is a made up name, so apologies if they're not actually malicious. Uh, and then it sends off the email containing your credentials to, to that inbox. And the last trick up their sleeve is that they're gonna redirect the victim to the legitimate website so that in the victim's eyes, they're just gonna say, I guess I put in my password incorrectly. I don't know what happened. I'm just gonna log in again and move about my day. They won't know that they've just been fished. This is generally the flow that you're gonna see. Now, whenever we go out and try to find these phishing kits, uh, there are two tricks that we can do to, to actually obtain them. We hooked into two community-driven feeds, one from OpenFish and one from Fish Tank, uh, that give out URLs of suspected phishing sites. Once we have these URLs, we work our way up each directory looking for two different things. The first and, and the easiest is an open directory index. If this is available, and around 24% of the time it is, if there is a phishing kit, it, you're gonna see it clear as day, just like you see in the screenshot. It's just .zip. It could be renamed, which is fine. We can still see it. The second thing that we look for is working our way up the directory tree. If directory indexes aren't enabled, we're just gonna use some, some very simple logic that says, chances are the zip file's gonna have the same name as the directory with .zip at the end of it. This is really, really effective, crazy effective, and it, it allows us to find all sorts of different kits. Now, the original research paper that came out a, a couple months back, we, we were talking about 3,000 kits that we found over the course of a month. At the end of the month, we decided, why stop the scanner? I mean, it's working, it's collecting good data, let's just keep it running, so why not? So as of yesterday, this is the, the latest data that I have, uh, we've collected over 10,000 unique uh, phishing kits based on the SHA-1 hash of the kit's contents. Since it's over 10,000, I personally feel pretty good about that completely arbitrary number. It just feels like a good number and I was glad it came out uh, before this talk. I was watching it pretty closely. And this is after looking at over 250 uh, suspected, uh, 250,000 suspected phishing URLs. So to put this a different way, in about five months, we've collected around 10,000 unique kits. 
so this is a mailer, and let's actually start analyzing. Let, now that we have phishing kits, let's think, what can we do with it? And we'll go back to the mailer uh, to start. We have the kit hash. What else can we look at for some interesting metrics? Now, there's two different fields in a mailer that are interesting to us. The first is where the data is going to. This is called the XFIL email address. The second, and one that is kind of overlooked a lot of times, is the from header that's added to the email that's sent containing your credentials. It's interesting, this is often used as a calling card of sorts for attackers who created the kit. They want some kind of notoriety, they want some kind of signature uh, on the credentials generated by their handiwork. And that's where they'll put this, is in that from field. We can take this data, we can take the hash of the kit, where the emails are going to and where the, the kit was supposedly created from, and we can map this out. Uh, this lets us establish relationships between different actors, the kits they use, and who created those kits. In the middle, you'll find different clusters. These clusters are for actors that have used multiple kits from multiple different creators, and you can see how everyone is connected uh, to their standard tools. This is the macro level, but at a more micro level, it, it looks something like this. You have the kit creator, what kits they're tied to, and then on the outskirts of that, you would have who is actively using their kits. So depending on who you're trying to look into, if you're going after the creators or you're going after the people using these kits, you may be looking at some different things. And as a fun fact, uh, we found hundreds of cases of backdoors uh, in different phishing kits. So these backdoors allow anyone, and I mean anyone, to completely compromise and take over the host that's serving that phishing kit. See if you can spot it in that code. And since we only have not very much time, I'll give a quick hint. It's right there. Uh, and, and this is a PHP script that is meant to try to block security researchers from hitting the phishing site. Their goal is to keep their sites up as long as possible. Uh, so this code supposedly blocks different bots and IP ranges belonging to people like VirusTotal or uh, uh, people like me. Uh, so these back doors are, were an interesting find. That's kind of a free, a free tidbit. You didn't have to, didn't have to pay for that. Uh, so whenever we're looking at these kits, it's important to realize that they're extremely effective, even though they're kind of commodity. You know, they, they will spoof service providers, and often they'll be very helpful in accepting whatever credentials you want to hand them. They'll accept Hotmail, Gmail, Office. They don't care. It'll, it'll always work. So whenever we look at how effective this kind of a pretext is, we can fall back on some other data. Duo, uh, the company that, that, that I work for, also has a, a free phishing simulation product called Duo Insight that allows organizations to test their exposure to phishing. Over the hundreds of thousands of emails that we've sent out, as of last Friday, these are the numbers of how effective very similar pretexts are to what you'll find in these phishing kits. 44% of people open the emails, 24% of people click the links in the emails, which if your browser and plugins are out of date, that can be game over depending on what you're clicking. Uh, and 12% of people enter their credentials. Here's a little bit more startling fact. 63% of our campaigns captured at least one credential. So as an attacker doing very basic pretext, it shows that phishing's ex uh, really effective. I don't think I need to convince anyone of that, but this is proof. Uh, now the code that we wrote to, to collect all this data is open source. I put it up on GitHub. Uh, you can download it and run it. But this is good from a security research perspective, you know, hooking into these different feeds, but what do I take away as a defender? You know, I have this new tool that's, that might help me out, but I don't really know what it's used for. So let's take a step back and look at it from a different angle. What can we take back to our own uh, organizations? One thing that I added yesterday was, the, was a feature that allows you to stand up a, a very simple web server. And so instead of feeding in from OpenFish and Fish Tank, uh, you can feed in your own URLs from your own sources. This can include URLs from your spam filter, from fish reports, both from employees reporting suspicious emails, as well as customers reporting suspicious emails that may be spoofing your own brand. And you can also get URLs from DMARC re reports. If you have a DMARC policy set up uh, as a reject policy, the forensic reports that you get back will include the URLs that were found in that email if it failed your DMARC policy. This is a really good way to get uh, phishing URLs that are trying to spoof your own brand uh, and your own domains. If you don't have, as a quick side note, if you don't have these feeds going into a central place, 
I highly recommend you do so because this lets you aggregate the types of phishing URLs that you're seeing affect your employees and your customers. So even if they're not going to this tool, I recommend that you're logging them somewhere. It's, it's really critical data. But in our case, we can send these uh, to the web server that we stood up for this tool, and it'll try to track down these kits. This gives you a, a picture of what kinds of kits are affecting your customers and your employees. This is why this is useful. Whenever it comes to incident response, a large part of our job is to be able to tell a story. We want to be able to tell end to end what happened uh, for this particular phishing incident. This involves having uh, different points of data. The more data and artifacts that I have, the better story that I can tell. The first piece of data that I care about is what data is actually collected from this phishing kit. Sure, I can maybe tell that credentials are collected, but a lot of phishing kits also collect GOIP information. They want to know where that victim was going to log in from so that they can log in from somewhere close by so maybe your machine learning doesn't pick it up because geographically, it's pretty close. Uh, a lot of them will also, as we saw, ca capture uh, IP address information, uh, you name it. So having the kit is the authoritative source of truth where you can figure out what data is being stolen uh, from the people affected by these attacks. The second thing that we can tell is where the data is going. Uh, this is something that you're not going to get if you're just looking at the phishing site itself. You're just going to have uh, your form. You're going to see that a form was submitted, and that's all you have to go off of. By having the kit itself, you get that XFIL email address. You know exactly who the attacker is that's collecting these credentials. And we'll talk about what you can do with that here in just a moment. But finally, we can, we can answer the question, do I actually care about this phishing attack? Is this something that is new? Is it noteworthy? Is it something that I need to follow up on? And I can use this data to start identifying some general trends, try to figure out uh, how this data is clustered compared to one another. So an interesting aspect about zip files is that whenever you download them, the files inside of them keep their original modified date. You know when they were last updated, when they were last created. This is really helpful because then you can start to map out how old is this file and how often do I see it. This is a relationship I, di I didn't uh, establish. I saw it, I, I don't remember the exact talk, but. Uh, a researcher mapped out this relationship and tried to figure out this is how we can almost break up what we care about into different quadrants. I applied this to the samples that we had, and this is what came out as a result. On the y-axis, you see the number of occurrences for a given file. We took every single file in each zip file, and we took the SHA-1 hash, and, and that's what you see, uh, the, the number of times that we encountered that particular file. And then on the x-axis, you see the age of the file uh, compared to whenever we actually pulled down that, that phishing kit. So for example, uh, we pulled down the phishing kit on December 5th. The file is dated December 1st. I know that file is four days old, and I can try to get an idea of, of how up to date this is. This is useful because a lot of times what you're going to find is the files in phishing kits are really freaking old. You know, they're, they're going to have copies of your website where you're like, how are people falling for this? You know, it's, it's, it, it looks like it's from whenever we were on GeoCities. You know, this is, you know, but, but it still works. But you can kind of get a, you can paint a picture as to how up to date this stuff is. You know, a lot of people these days are starting to use site canaries to try to figure out when people are cloning their websites. You can also look at the files themselves and figure out, hey, is my canary in here or are they actively taking it out? Do I need to start switching up tactics? Now let's look at what these relationships mean. The first quadrant that's arguably the biggest are old files that are seen a whole bunch. This is your, your boring standard phishing kits. This is your commodity stuff, the, the things that you see over and over that have the logos of every single service provider you can imagine saying, just put in one of these credentials, I don't care which. You know, that's the stuff that you can safely assume probably wasn't a targeted attack. You know, this is stuff that's probably a, a wide net being cast. And then the next uh, type of quadrant are old files that we don't see very often. These are kind of what I would presume are, are phasing out. You know, they're going to be the older copies of your login pages. These are going to be the older copies of service providers' login pages that you may still see occasionally from a few different actors, but people are starting to shift towards newer copies uh, of this content. 
And then you have the new files, which uh, are seen quite a bit. This is the new standard. This is the, the up-to-date, what people are using very frequently, uh, but, it, but it is updated content. These are people who are actively trying to improve uh, the efficacy of their fishing kit. So this is potentially interesting. This is stuff that you want to be aware of. You want to see those new trends, and you want to see how people are adapting to changes in the content. And finally, we have that last quadrant, the smallest, which are new files which aren't seen very often. This is interesting because this could indicate a couple of different things. For one, it could be a brand new, um, a brand new type of attack or a brand new fishing kit that's still very generic, but it's not seen very much. So it could be kind of an up and comer that's just getting started. The second possibility is that it's a targeted attack. This may be something that you could look at and say, of all the fishing kits, maybe something in here is more closely targeting my brand or targeting my employees. Maybe it's gonna be a copy of my Outlook web access login form that I care about. So this is the quadrant that you're gonna wanna live in because it gives you the most interesting data. So using these quadrants, we can identify those trends and we can figure out where to best spend our time. Remember, I don't think there's anyone in here that says, I have way too much free time at work. There's not enough for me to look at. You know, we have to prioritize. We have to figure out where our cycles are best spent. And this is one of the more empirical ways we can do just that. And to wrap up, we talked about being able to figure out where these credentials are going to. You know, having that XFIL email address. Uh, Google recently teamed up with UC Berkeley and they released a paper called Data Breaches, Phishing, or Malware, Understanding the Risks of Stolen Credentials. I was super excited because this came out right around the same time as, uh, as my paper on phishing kits and they cover a lot of the same topic but from different angles. So I was like a kid in the candy store. I was so excited to, to read this paper and I highly recommend you do so. Uh, that's where this graph on the, uh, on the right there is from. So what they did is they used a little bit of PHP analysis to figure out not where the emails are going, but what the emails look like. So emails will typically have a, a custom subject, you know, XX fishing creds, you know, Outlook XX, you know, with, with different hyphens, different parameters, different placement, it looks different. It's, it's still basic text, but it may look different for each individual actor or each individual type of kit. They took this template, this email template, and they added it to their own anti-abuse systems in order to flag emails being sent to Gmail accounts that they control. So if, a, if an actor is using a Gmail account as that XFIL, they would be able to see patterns of these credentials being sent in. Pretty cool stuff. So using this data, they were able to figure out that approximately 200,000 uh, people per week were affected by phishing that they could tell, uh, which shows that this activity is very much ongoing. Now taking a step back, this is why having that XFIL email is so important. By knowing where credentials are being sent, we can start reaching out to these mail providers and letting them know, hey, in case you didn't know about it, this is an active threat targeting my user base, targeting my customers, my employees, uh, and these are where those credentials are being sent. This could very well tip them off into a larger uh, category uh, of threats, not only for that one XFIL email address, but for any similar type of activity they see across their systems. So we can not only protect ourselves, but we can help protect the ecosystem uh, on a much larger level using some very basic data that we get from downloading these kits. And so all this wrapped up, uh, I think this pretty well concludes the talk, concludes the research uh, portion. So thank you all for coming out and I'm happy to take questions. Are you, uh, since you've got all this data that you ran for quite a while and still running it sounds like, um, besides um, identifying the, the malicious email addresses that are collecting all the data, are you doing anything else to be able to identify the threat actor groups or seeing trends in that area? That's a good question. There, there is ongoing work to try to figure out um, not specific actors, but more concerned around how they're linked together to try to figure out activity uh, from, from you could call it groups, but it's hard whenever you only have email addresses because is it a group or is it just one person rotating email addresses? But having that, that graph that we saw earlier of those connections between actors and the kits they're associated with uh, really kind of lends itself to, to graph theory really, really well where you can start 
uh, trying to find those communities, trying to find those uh, uh, like actors who are using some of the similar tactics. That's an area that I'm not very well versed in, admittedly, but um, there is some ongoing work to try to track some of those people down. Yes. We got some, we got some uh, people in the Slack. I know Jeff asked a question. I don't see him in here. And uh, I don't know who Blind Bauer is. Oh, perfect. I'm just blind. Uh, great presentation. Um, do you have any plans to share the kits that you've collected so far with other researchers, other companies, um, or just making it available to people? Yes, that's a really good question. So um, I've thought about this a lot because I'm a huge fan of open data. I love it. You know, if it were if it were just my data, I'd be I'd be opening it from day one. But we have to be careful because what we don't want to become is a clearinghouse for phishing kits for people to take and use elsewhere. That said, if you're interested in the data, please come find me after the talk. You know, let's talk, let's, let's figure something out. We're in the business of enabling everyone to, to take on phishing as a community. So let's work together. Um, we're gonna share every bit of data that we can. So if you're interested in the data, please come find me and let's, let's chat. Yes, so the question was, can I make the slides available? And I'll drop them on Slack uh, right after the presentation, you bet. So in light of the, um, what you've talked about with both your research and Google's paper, have you seen in, in your data any shifting of tactics, like people moving away from using Gmail to using something that's a little less transparent, or even uh, going away from doing uh, email, uh, sending creds via email to doing something like, say, just posting it to some anonymized website or some CT backend? I haven't seen uh, general trends of that. There's always going to be those one-off cases, because there are kids that do different things, like post them to a web server or... Um, I've also seen logging to a file, which is, is still in the web route. Anyone can request that and see exactly which credentials were, were taken. But um, general trends, no. And I think the, the overarching reason is because it still just, it works really, really well. Um, and Gmail isn't the only XBIL email address that we see. We see a lot of, uh, you know, Yahoo, MailRU, you know, places like that. But uh, I'd be interested, that's a good point. I'm going to keep an eye out for that from now on to see if we do see any of those um, shifting tactics, so to speak. <laughs> Will do, you bet. So you are seeing uh, a, a, a new trend towards uh, email addresses hosting on servers outside of the U.S. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, that's what uh, that's what we see. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're see serve for higher ed. So we find lots of phishing sites mm -hmm. that are you know targeting higher education and outside. Yeah. So it's not. We do see uh, mostly Gmail, Yahoo, but lots of other like you said, Mail.ru, Yandex. I'm trying to think of some other ones, but a lot of them are hosted out of the external to the U.S. <coughs> so that's what we're seeing. I'd be interested to compare data. Let's chat uh, after the presentation there. Thank you. So in looking through these 10,000 phishing kits, mm -hmm. uh, it, okay, let me back up. It's my opinion that the, the number of unique phishing kits that you've been able to identify is far less than the number of deployments of those phishing kits, that, that 250,000. In looking through those, have you found a way to combat or to prevent uh, the actual like the actual posting of credentials to the kits by looking at the kits as opposed to where those kits have been deployed. Does that make sense? I can give you an example of sure. so so in some of the kits that I've researched, they'll have like blacklist of if your reverse DNS entry for the IP that you're coming from has AWS, right. then block right. So I've thought about well, what if all of my users look like they're coming from AWS? Sweet, I just got blacklisted from every phishing kit that there is. Mm -hmm. Are there any other things like that that are kind of out of the box defense, or uh, uh, yeah, thinking outside of the box from a defense mechanism that, that you can think of? That'd be, that'd be an interesting technical challenge to really go outside of the box of the standard mitigating measures like you know, using a password manager which associates credentials to, to a domain, uh, using something like, uh, uh, I was gonna say WebAuthn, but that's not really deployed anywhere. But outside of the box, let's, let's chat about that. I haven't really 
found a, a a clean way because even something like that, having all of your users come from something that resolves to AWS, that would be, it would feel to me like a band-aid. It would feel like um, um, something that I would hope they're using that HD access file and it wouldn't really be a guarantee, but it'd be interesting to chat about some different ideas. I, I really like that. Anyone else? All right, well, thanks, Jordan. Great. This was Thank awesome. You. All right, we have uh, reached our mid-afternoon break.